interested in the season pass for Who Killed Julie? Want to hear all seven episodes today? Head over to paulsading.com. Click on the shop button at the top of the page and look for the Who Killed Julie download. You get five and a half hours of this story with your purchase and you also help us begin funding the follow-on series to this story. Thank you for your support. Who Killed Julie is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is highly advised. This episode of Who Killed Julie is brought to you by my debut novel, Chasing the Demon, a thriller adapted from season one of my Subject Found podcast. That woman is unconscionable. The audacity, the fucking audacity of her to talk to me like that. I don't care. I hung up on her. She can kiss my ass. I regret ever telling her that I love her. She makes me miss dad even more. Julie's Journal, October 14th, 2001. Julie McLemore was a mother, an independent woman, and a state employee. She worked hard for her children and didn't mind doing what needed to be done to support them. Julie was the embodiment of duplicity. Complex, adored, and demonized. And she was murdered. A man was charged, but proclaimed his innocence right up until the moment he hung himself in his prison cell. He wrote a letter to Julie's family, begging for their help, pleading with them to believe him that he didn't, that he wouldn't harm Julie. His name was Roderick Alba. We'll talk about his story another time. This is Julie's story. The story of a single mother struggling to make it in a world that no longer seemed interested in helping even those who are motivated to help themselves. Those who, thanks to fate or chance, find life throws a roadblock in front of them at every opportunity. This is her story. This is the story of us. I am Emerald Johnson, and this is Who Killed Julie. Angela Morrison is a stout woman in her early 60s and looks every bit the part of a woman hardened by a joyless life. She still worked part-time, served on the board of directors for Chamber of Commerce, and even helped run her husband's craft stand at the farmer's market in Olympia on weekends. She was a busy woman, which might be one reason why she waited so long to reach out to me. Or maybe it was because she'd been mourning since her daughter's death. I make it a habit of not judging anyone. At least I try not to judge, especially those whose experience I, myself, haven't had to live through. But there's also the inquisitive part of me, the professional in me that is more than mildly curious why it took Angela so long to call me back and why, for a woman who is so comfortable in life, at least financially, it took a group of other women to get together and fundraise for Julie's memory. I'm not interested in castigating Angela or disrespecting Julie's memory. I'm only interested in doing the job I was hired to do, to ensure the most famous murder in Olympia's history didn't fade into obscurity, only to be eternally viewed through the lens of being another detached and sensationalized news story to serve media outlets' incessant and desperate need to drive ratings. Executing my duties means asking questions, lots of questions about everyone. No one is free from scrutiny. They shouldn't be. There's a story here, and it's a story this small city wants. I need to bring it to them without bias or preferential treatment for the dead or their mothers. Yes, sweetie. I've got another one somewhere. Let me see. What color is it? I really like these, but I was just hoping to see if you had any other options. I'll look. I'm sure I do. If not here, we have it back at the house. 
I can give you a card for the website so you can order there, or I can put it on reserve for you if you want to come out next weekend. Oh, we can't. We're out of Portland. We were just swinging through Olympia, and we love hitting farmers markets in different towns. So we decided to stop by. It's weird, I know, but it's just neat to see. Kind of gives us a sense of a town. There are farmers markets, you know. I know, I know. It's silly. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. How many have you been to? We're up to 103. Well, four. 104 now, I guess. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. You two do a lot of traveling. I'll be right with you in a second, sweetie. No worries. A lot more than reasonable people would. Yes. We're childless, and both of us have a lot of flexibility with our jobs, so we get away a lot. But <laughs> we stick to the West Coast. Oh yeah? Why is that? There's some great markets down south. Um, my partner, she's around here somewhere. She's always getting distracted, especially in markets. We tried to go other places, but well. Some places around the country aren't ready for a couple like us, so we stayed at the progressive parts, places like this. The rest of the country can kiss my fat ass, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I see. Well, I'm sorry. I thought I had one for you, but I I can't find it. Oh, that's too bad. Well, thank you, anyways. You have a safe trip home. Thank you. How can I help you, sweetie? Angela? Yes. Are you that that reporter? Emerald. Emerald Johnson. Is there a place we could talk more privately? Hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a coffee shop across the street from the market. We could talk there. Maybe get something to drink. Won't be bothered, and honestly, I could use a break. I'll meet you there as soon as Henry comes back. <laughs> Ah, uh, he's at a woodworking stall, always looking to buy some of that guy stuff. I swear, we come here to make money, but he can't help tempting himself with anything made from wood. As God is my witness. Sounds good. I'll see you there. You work at the market every weekend. Mm-hmm. I have for years. I like it. Keeps you busy, I guess. And it's nice to get out of the house, see people, things like that. Understandable. Did you have the stand when Julie was still at home? No. This is something we started after she left for college. Henry and I were both professionals. Never thought we'd start our own little side business, but we like it. it. Keeps us active, and the house was just a little too quiet after she left for college. She went to school back east, right? Yeah, Syracuse. I hated that decision. Walter, her. Biological father wasn't all that thrilled to have his baby three thousand miles away either. Was worried she'd stay there forever. Did you ever think about moving? Where? There? Miss Johnson. Johnson. But please, call Emerald. me Emerald. Right. We visited Julie during her freshman year. We couldn't get out there until after the holidays when things settled down again. I I think it had to be about March, maybe even the end of March. Have you ever been to Syracuse? No. Consider that a pleasing from the Lord, then. Not a fan, then. I take it. There was about three foot of snow on the ground, and it was almost April. I remember that specifically because Henry was stressing about getting back and finishing up the taxes. There's no good reason to have that much snow on the ground ever. Never mind that time of year. <laughs> Did Julie <laughs> like it there? <laughs> She loved it there. You don't sound happy about that. We're a small family. We're close. We've always been close. It was hard for us to see our little girl move so far away, and extra hard to see her enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. We always wanted her to be happy. You just wanted her to be happy a little closer to home. That makes sense. Yes, I, I guess that's the selfish side of being a parent. You raise them the best you can and hope they're high-functioning, well-adjusted adults. You hope you've done your job well enough that they can survive in the world, but there's that little part of you that always wants them nearby. I don't know. I, I guess it's just comforting to know that you you could drive to them if they need you, that you can be there for the significant moments in their lives, and even those little chance meetings in the grocery store. 
You don't get that when they're that far away. How many times did you go see her up there? Just that first time. And then again when she graduated. It was expensive and, and we had our jobs and then, I don't know, we just... Life got in the way? Yeah. At Syracuse, did she have a lot of friends or did she pretty much keep to herself? Oh, she had friends all right. Not the best ones either. That's what happens in school, isn't it? Didn't it for you? I mean, even back when I was in school, you found yourself meeting all sorts of new people. Something about being independent for the first time in your life and finding those you relate to who are as lonely as you, that type of stuff. Julie had friends there. It started in the dormitory. First her roommate and then girls she met in the halls, then people from classes, then parties, and on and on. You know how it goes. <laughs> I do. She was always very sociable. Always. Which is amazing when you consider some of the things that happened to her earlier in her life. But, no. She never had a problem making friends. It, it didn't matter if it was kindergarten or college. People just seemed to be drawn to her. Who'd she get that from? Henry. Henry? Not her father? Well, maybe a little. Henry was an influence, though, a, a big one. Just because he was her stepfather doesn't mean he wasn't. She probably got a little from me, too, but I'm not a natural like she was. I've got to fake it when I'm running the stand. It's exhausting, you know, talking to people all day. I'd much rather we had a strictly online business, to be honest. Dealing with people can be tough at times. <laughs> Yeah, I think I saw that. Oh, that. Yeah, well. Are you a Christian, Miss Johnson? Emerald, please. And yes, I am. Why? Are you okay with people like that? I'm afraid I'm confused. What do you mean? Before, when you walked up to the stand, the woman I was helping, are you okay with people like that? Miss Morrison. Angela. If I'm calling you by your first name, I'd like to think you could call me by mine. Okay, Angela. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with the question. Oh, okay. <sighs> no matter how long I live here, I don't think I can get used to some of the carefree and careless attitudes some people have. Seems people don't care about morality because it's too inconvenient for them. It makes it hard to deal with people sometimes. I told Henry, I told him, he needed to hire some kid to run the stand for us, at, at least in the Olympia market, and I could tend to the other markets down in the Centralia and such. But he doesn't want the expense. Says even high schoolers cost too much. I don't agree with him, and he definitely doesn't understand how annoying this can be sometimes, especially when you have to deal with certain types. In business, isn't all money green? regardless of who it comes from? Of course. I just prefer not to have to deal with some people. I've got to be honest, Angela. As a black woman, I'm uncomfortable with comments like that. She was a customer, someone who liked your products, nothing more. She's just like everyone else. Those are two different things. What are? You're black. You were born that way. Nothing you could do about it. Not that there's anything wrong with it either, but those types. Did Julie have the same type of attitude about gay and lesbian couples? Julie was a little loose with her attitudes about the way some people choose to live their lives. She'd always tell us that we needed to accept it and move on. She'd tell us the same garbage the people in the liberal media say, but Emerald, I don't care about that. None of it. I, I don't have to change who I am because the liberals say it's the thing to do. They're wrong about a lot, so they've got no place to be telling me how to live. Was it a problem between you two, or you and her father? We'd have some arguments about it, sure, but it wasn't anything big. She had her way of thinking, and, and we have ours. So long as that stuff isn't brought into our home, I'm okay with it. Did Julie do that? Did she bring it into your house? She wasn't the same when she came home after school. That damn school changed her. How so? She was different. She... Emerald, I'm really uncomfortable talking about this. 
When you heard that I'd been hired to tell Julie's story, you were initially excited about talking, so your side of things could be told. Do you still want that? I, I just don't want to talk about stuff like this. Why? I... What she was doing was sinful. Those damn universities, they let these young kids get wild. No one's watching over them. No one's making sure they're okay. They can do what the hell they want and it's encouraged. I don't know if that's completely accurate. No churches, no family responsibilities, nothing but a bunch of drunk, horny kids experimenting with a lot of sinful stuff and no adults there to tell them to knock it off, to remind them of their moral duties. That isn't right. I get the feeling something happened to Julie while she was at Syracuse. Something bad, hard to talk about. Uh, Am I right? You don't know? Know what? Oh, I thought you knew, at least by now. I, I shouldn't have said anything. You thought I knew what? <sighs> Julie was, she was, raped when she was at that damn school. Throughout this series of Who Killed Julie, we will be partnering with Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to raise funds for their operations. Safe Place provides crucial services to survivors of domestic and sexual violence. They offer a 24-hour helpline, 24-hour emergency shelter, and sexual assault response, advocacy support groups, legal clinics, children and youth programs, prevention education, community outreach, and training. Please see the donation link in the episode notes. Help us raise as much as we possibly can for Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to serve people who need them now. Today, Olympia, Washington. Tomorrow, your city. Let's change the world. That wasn't the end of my conversation with Angela, but it's all I'm going to include for now. Julie was a freshman at Syracuse in 2001, the year Angela says her daughter was raped at a party. A lot of drunk students in a small house, doing what drunk students do. At some point during the evening, Julie was assaulted by a fellow student. After that conversation with Angela, I checked public records, news stories, police reports, even blogs, anything I had access to, and couldn't validate her claim. That lack of corroborating evidence led me to ask Rachel about it, of course, to see if she knew anything. They didn't go to school together, but as close as they were, if anyone knew Julie's darkest secrets, it'd be her friend. That's for later. We will get to it. We have to. As horrible as sexual assault is, I still had trouble following Angela's line of thinking about Julie's experience in college and what happened later during her adult life. I'm not even sure Angela understands her reasoning. Could the rape, if it happened, have anything to do with Julie's adult depression? Possibly. I'm not discounting that at all. One in five women experience sexual assault. It's an ugly fact about society as a whole, and even though we're finally becoming enlightened about sexual violence, we still have a long way to go. If one thing came out of my conversation with Angela, besides her bigoted attitudes toward the LGBTQIA community, it's that she also had a long way to go in understanding her daughter's experience. I hadn't yet met Walter, Julie's father, but that visit was coming. Being completely honest here, I wasn't so interested in including Henry's opinion unless I found something that drove me in his direction. But Walter, yeah, I was very interested to hear what he thought about all this. And well, it was important to the story to have him tell his side. Before any of that though, I had to follow up with Rachel and talk about what Julie went through at Syracuse. Though Angela seemed convinced that Julie's life would have turned out differently if it hadn't happened, I'm not so sure. I don't want to sound callous, and I don't want my personal feelings about Angela getting in the way of my ability to tell the story, but I think she was off the mark. I'm not trying to discredit her. Her input helped me flesh out who Julie was, but 
I'll be damned if I allow someone with those attitudes to build the box to put this woman in. Not as long as I'm the one writing this story. No one deserves that. Especially someone who went through what she went through. Hi, Rachel. I'm sorry to bother you unannounced. Hi. I needed an excuse to get away from the desk for a minute. What's up? You're at work? I can call later. No, that's okay. What do you need? I talked to Angela. <laughs> and how did that go? What's that tone all about? Oh, nothing. Angela is a gem of a human being. I'm noting a hint of sarcasm. You're noting a whole lot more than that. I'm serving you an entire dish of it. <laughs> so, not a fan, huh? Of her? No. She's a horrible person. Why do you say that? You talk to her. You should know. I try to keep my personal feelings aside from my professional duties. Guess that's why you're the one writing Julie's story instead of me. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't hold my tongue even if I could deal with her, which I don't think I could. Anyways, what is it you wanted to know? I'm pretty sure you didn't call me in the middle of the day to talk about that woman. No, I didn't. Uh, talk to me about Julie's time at Syracuse. I didn't go to school with her. I stayed out here. <laughs> Out-of-state tuition is ridiculous. <laughs> Preach it, yes. I know that all too well. You went out-of-state too? UC Davis. Oh. I didn't know that was a journalism school. It's not. Not really. I, I had a change of heart halfway through my sophomore year. Kind of threw me off my stride, but I graduated, and I like what I do, so it ended up being okay. So, Julie went through some trying times at Syracuse. Do you know about them? That's a pretty broad question. What kind of problems did Julie have at Syracuse? Do you know about anything bad that happened to her while she was there? Everyone has something bad happen to them at that point in their lives, don't they? Then we look back at it as adults and we see it's sort of silly that we spend so much time and energy being upset about it. Julie had boy problems, school problems, homesickness. She wasn't any different than any of us, I can assure you. So you don't know about what happened to her then? At Syracuse? Maybe. You're not giving me a lot to go on here. Angela told me that Julie was sexually assaulted when she was a freshman. Yeah, she was. What do you know about what happened? Does it matter? I don't know. It may. Why don't you tell me what you know, and I'll put it all together afterwards. There's nothing to put together. Rachel... Are we going to do this dance every time I need something from you? I just don't think it's important, okay? It was something that happened. Something that was a dark time for her, but she moved on. Angela thinks differently. Yeah. Well, she's a bitch who had problems with just about everything Julie did, so I'm not surprised. Please tell me what Julie told you about that experience. Anything might be helpful. There's no way of knowing until I know what she shared with you about it. It could be important. All right. She called me the night it happened. She was in tears, of course. Distraught. And she didn't trust any of her girlfriends out there enough to tell them. Not by that point. They hadn't been out there long enough. She was still drunk when she called. Scared as hell. I think it kind of sobered her up. I know, I know, that's not how it works, but trust me. She was coherent. <laughs> she was, uh, she was crying so much I couldn't understand what she was actually talking about. I kept asking her what happened, if she was okay, if there was something I could do. <laughs> hell, I even asked if I needed to call her mother. unlike herself. What do you mean? Just that... Julie never had a problem making a decision. She was pretty decisive, in fact. One of the things I admired about her. So for her to act like that? Told me she was in a bad place, yeah? <sighs> I knew that damn woman her entire life. Did you ever get it out of her, or 
did you find out later? That night? Yeah. After like an hour on the phone. I shut up. My gut told me something big was going on, that this wasn't just a homesickness or something. I wish there was something I could have done. Back it up for me, please. What did she say happened? I'm really not interested in giving you the gruesome details. Are you interested in getting Julie's story told? Don't give me ultimatums. Not about her. I'm not. But the information you have could change the course of things or fill in holes before they become craters. Look, I'm doing this one way or another. Either you're going to help me tell her story or you're going to allow other people, people like her mother, to tell it. Do you think Julie is the first woman to be sexually assaulted in college? It happens all the time. It happens far too often. Julie isn't alone, and if this is something, no matter how small, that was part of who she was, then doesn't she deserve that? Don't Especially from do you? that. Don't do what? Don't use her as a tool. Then help me, Rachel. I didn't know her. I can't do this on my own. I've got a list of people to talk to, and every single one of them is going to tell me a story about her. Their version of the story. Don't you want your version of Julie's story to be heard? Wouldn't she do the same for you? Or would you prefer tens of thousands of people heard her mother's version? Fuck you. You know I'm right. Listen, I'm not interested in demonizing Julie's memory. I'm not interested in passing judgment on what she did or didn't do. And I do care about what happened to her. That's my starting point with her story, okay? You know, at some point you're going to have to decide between trusting me and not. So, what do you say? She was at a party at a frat house. She didn't want to go, but one of her girlfriends begged her to. So she did. (laughs) That's the kind of woman she was. She didn't like the guys, most of the guys. But there was one in particular she was excited to meet. His name was Caleb Haskins. Okay. So she went, hoping she could keep her girlfriend happy and maybe get a chance to talk to Caleb. He was a junior, but she'd seen him around campus in some of the circles she ran with. (laughs) She used to talk about this cute guy all the time, like all the time. So... In a way, I think she was kind of hoping to go to the party. Thrilled when this girlfriend asked her. So, the party went like parties go when you get a bunch of college students together drinking. Things got stupid. Was she having a good time? She was having a great time. So what happened? Uh, Hell if I know. She's drinking, she's dancing, she said she remembers playing drinking games, but doesn't remember which ones. Her and Caleb hit it off, apparently. They started talking, and it progressed until they were flirting. Their flirting progressed to them making out and grinding on each other like typical college students. Nothing dangerous. Nothing that should have been a warning to her. She remembered spots of the night, but not everything. She blacked out? From the sounds of it. Was it Caleb? Was he the one? Rachel? What? Was he the one who assaulted Julie? You're such a bitch for prying into her life like this. I've got a job to do. An unpleasant job. So forgive me if I don't care what you think about me personally. Tell me something. Why are you so protective of her? What are you hiding? I don't need this shit. She hung up on me. (laughs) She hung up on me for asking about the woman she was friends with her entire life. What possible reason could she have for acting like that? 
I get being protective of your girlfriend. I've got no problem with that. But come on, if helping set the record straight is your moral imperative, then you don't act like that. Except that wasn't it with Rachel, was it? You're going to learn it was very difficult getting information out of that woman. It made me question her motives more than once. She knew what this project was about. She knew why I was hired to do this. Maybe she didn't like the open-ended nature of the story. Maybe it bothered her that she didn't get to determine the narrative. I don't know. But I'm not the kind to capitulate. I wasn't going to let her determine where this story went. I get it. I understand why she'd want to protect the memory of her best friend. God, I know I must sound like such a horrible person right now, but I'm going to ask you to stick with me on this. There's a method to my approach. It's sort of like a defense lawyer's claim that they do what they do in the name of justice, not out of self-interest or a desire to protect a likely criminal. They just want to preserve justice above everything else. Well, it's the same sort of principle for me. I'm interested in preserving the story over anything else, including Rachel's desire to paint Julie as a saint. She wasn't. But then again, who is? Are you? I'm sure as hell not. There have been things I've done in my life even I find disturbing, things I'm not proud of. I'm sure you can identify with that, if you're honest with yourself. Then I have to ask, so what? So what if Julie wasn't a saint? It's one thing for her mother to have a problem with it, but why would anyone else? Especially her best friend. Julie isn't here anymore. Her memory won't be defined by this podcast. Not to the people who cared for her, regardless of how many thousands of you are listening. You didn't know Julie. I didn't know Julie. I'm just trying to tell her story. And to do that, we have to explore her past. That's not optional. Our pasts don't define us. Our choices do. The shit that happens to us in between is the book that's already been read, not the book to be written. Julie made bad decisions, so what? We all have, we all do. She also made wonderful decisions, many of which she had to make alone in the face of adversity, in the face of judgment from a world that still insists on putting the actions of women under the microscope for whatever goddamn purposes that examination serves. She made tough choices, difficult choices, decisions a lot of people wouldn't have been able to make. We shouldn't judge her for that. The next time we get together, we'll explore the side of Julie where she hid her demons. We'll look at some of the things she did and some of the things Angela hinted at, but didn't have the courage to discuss. We'll also talk about some of the men in Julie's life. And that's where her story begins to take a turn. Be sure to tune in in two weeks for the third installment of Julie's story. The story of us. You've been listening to Who Killed Julie. I'm Emerald Johnson. Thank you for listening. And as always, keep questioning. Who Killed Julie is written and edited by Paul Sading. You can find more about me and my books and other audio drama podcasts, my writing podcast, over at paulsading.com. It is produced and sound designed by the excellent Dog and Pony Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. They are also the company that produced the second season of Subject Found. You can find them at dogandponystudios.net. Emerald Johnson was played by the one and only, the absolutely wonderful and highly talented audiobook narrator, Ashley Litzy. You can find more about Ashley, her work, and her services over at deepcurvesahead.com. Angela Morrison was Robin Siegerman. You can find Robin and her books over at robinsegerman.com. Rachel Leonard is the one and only Rihanna McAfee. You can find her on twitter.com forward slash re McAfee. John McLean of Dog and Pony Studios 
played Walter McLemore. You can find him at dogandponystudios.net. Christopher Rocco, Olympia bass actor, played Caleb Haskins. You can find Caleb's live performances by checking out the schedule at oletheater.com. And Lauren Wisniewski played the customer in episode two. She's a wonderful voice actor who you can find at lawofalltrades.wordpress.com. I want to give a special thanks to Amy Joy Hilt, who beta read for this podcast, volunteered her services, and really helped me tweak it to make sure that it was ready and appropriate for the material. Amy is a teacher in England and sometimes writer, and I want to thank Amy for her help. This show wouldn't have been what it is without her. If you want to find more about my stories, if you want exclusive stories, if you want insights, special posts, live messaging, early and exclusive access, stories that no one else is going to hear, and you really like what I'm doing with Who Killed Julie, you want to see the second part of this series happen, become a patron. Go over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading, pick a reward level that works for your budget and the exclusives that you want, and help me start funding the next show in this series. You can also find this show, paulsating.com forward slash who dash killed dash Julie, where you can find all of the wonderful actor bios. It's on Libsyn, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play. The show is also on Facebook and Twitter, as am I. You can find me at Paul Sating or at Who Killed Julie. The artwork is done by the wonderful Kessie Rolinicki, who does all of my book covers and podcast covers. And of course, that music that is absolutely perfect for this show was done by none other than John Eric de Guzman of Dog and Pony Studios. Thank you for your download and your listen. Please tell a friend about the show. Please help us spread this important message, this important story, Julie's story, the story of us. Music in these credits is provided by Richard Temple.